It's two o'clock. Welcome everybody to Real Time PCR. This is the third in the series. Tomorrow is troubleshooting. Please don't miss troubleshooting. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is, first of all, what is real time PCR? And I will often refer to it as qPCR. Um, that stands for quantitative PCR and is a way to discriminate it from RT-PCR, which is reverse transcriptase PCR. There are QRT-PCRs, which are real-time reverse transcriptase PCRs. So if you want to quantify RNA rather than DNA, you need to have the RT step in there. But there is a lot of literature that refers to real-time PCR as RT-PCR, and that can be incredibly confusing. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how real-time works, how the uh, machines work, and how the chemistry works. And then we're going to go through some data analysis, look at the different kinds of data you can analyze and different methods for doing that, talk about what real time can be used for. And then finally, uh, what is necessary if you're going to publish your real time PCR? What details do you need to include in your manuscript? Okay, so real time PCR is really just a fluorescent version of regular PCR. But you have an increase in fluorescence over time that matches the amount of amplicon that has been produced. And because all of this is captured with a camera, you can visualize the reaction as it progresses rather than just looking at your final end product. And the quantification is available to figure out what your original target copy number was. So how many individual DNA targets were in that tube when you pushed run on the thermocycler. There are a number of different kinds of real-time PCR. There is dye-based and probe-based. Dye-based is uh, generally a cyber green or um, derivative of cyber green. This would be cyber green one because cyber green two binds to RNA and not DNA. Cyber green one only binds to double stranded DNA. So it is measuring the accumulation of double stranded products in your reaction. A probe based real time PCR can be a number of different types. The most common is TACMAN um, minor groove binder, MGB, is very similar to TACMAN. Molecular beacons um, has a bit of a different basic chemistry, but the idea is mostly the same. And then there are all of these other methods that um, are just variations on the TACMAN chemistry. Okay, so what is real-time PCR? I am going to run this. The polymerase chain reaction technique can be modified into a variety of useful modifications, including one called real-time PCR. Real-time PCR relies on all the components of a standard PCR reaction, the target DNA, the oligonucleotides, the primer, the free nucleotide triphosphates, and a TAC polymerase. The twist in the real-time PCR is this. This technique employs a fluorescent oligonucleotide probe, which allows researcher to monitor the progress of the reaction as it occurs in real time. The probe contains two fluorescent dyes, a reported dye on the 5' end 
and the quencher die on the three prime end. When the reporter is excited by light, it transfers its energy to the nearby quencher. This process of energy transfer called fluorescence resonance energy transfer or FRET. It prevents the reported dye from emitting that light. The probe participates in the PCR cycles which begin with the heat denaturation of the DNA. The temperature is then lowered and the probe and primers anneal to the specific sequence on the DNA strands. TAC DNA polymerase synthesizes complementary DNA using the primer as a starting point. When the polymerase encounters the probe and the polymerase isn't actually blocked, the polymerase has a 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease activity that it uses to digest the probe. At the same time, the polymerase contains two elongate, the new DNA strand. The cleavage of the probe is an essential part of this reaction because it separates the reported dye from the quenched dye. When the light excites the reported dye, the reported dye can now fluoresce and the quenched dye is too far from the reported dye to block its emission. In the next PCR cycle, twice the number of the template DNA molecules are available for the reaction. Again, the probe molecules anneal to the templates along with the primers. As the reaction proceeds, the reported dyes are liberated into the solution. The next fluorescence measurement pick up the fluorescence from both the PCR cycle. After each cycle, the intensity of fluorescence is measured and the data from all the cycles are used to construct an amplification plot as you can see. In this experiment, different numbers of starting DNA molecules from 1000 to 10 million were used in a parallel reactions. A reaction with no template DNA was also run. The time at which fluorescence increases over the background level reflects the amount of DNA in the original sample with the earliest detectable reaction occurring in the same time with most starting materials. Real-time PCR is a quantitative essay providing the ability to compare experimental samples with known reference samples. In contrast, in standard PCR technique, the reactions are retrieved at the end of the cycle while the reactions are no longer running efficiently due to the part of limiting reacting agents and are therefore not quantitative. Thank you, Shomu. He does a fantastic job. He has a lot of um, really, really smart videos um, that I've learned a lot from. Okay, uh, so how the real-time thermal cyclers work is very simple. Your reactions are assembled into these 96-well microtiter dishes, and those dishes go into a uh, a drawer if you're using an ABI thermocycler um, that gets pushed in under uh, the lights. So up here at the top or in front of the, uh, the light source is a set of filters and the light coming through the filter gets changed to the wavelength that is the appropriate excitation wavelength for the probe that you are using. The, uh, the probe then, after it's been cleaved by the, the uh, polymerase, it starts to emit a light at a different wavelength, which is uh, detected by the camera and that the amount of light at every set is recorded. So here's just a brief cartoon of thermocycling. So if you uh, do your initial denaturation hot and then drop for annealing, um, if you have designed your real-time primers and probes correctly, your probe will attach to your template as this temperature is dropping. 
and then the primers will bind afterwards. You want the primers to bind after the probe does so that you actually get probe cleavage with the amplification step. There's the elongation step, um, the amplification step, and that is when the thermocycler will take the reading of the light and then back up to 95 degrees to repeat the cycle. Um, many real-time cycling parameters only are a two-step, so from 95 degrees down to 60 degrees or something like that. In that case, the primers have been designed to bind before uh, the thermocycler, the sample gets to 60 degrees, um, and the probe still needs to bind the DNA before the primers do, but you can change it to just a two-step cycling. So fluorescence, as it is generated in the reaction captured by the camera, is recorded on the screen of the thermocycler, and you can watch as the fluorescence develops over time. What will be shown on the screen is something, a, a graph very much like this, where the number of cycles, uh, thermal cycles, are at the bottom, and for real-time PCR, 35 to 45 cycles is, is normal, with 35 cycles being most normal. Um, on the x-axis, and then the y-axis is something called relative fluorescence units. So it's not a real measure. It is just a, a measure of the light relative to the initial fluorescence. So before the cycling starts, the camera takes a picture of the plate and gets a background reading on how much fluorescence is coming out of each well. And then the amount of fluorescence on top of that for each well is then calculated and recorded on the graph over time, time being the x-axis. So at the very beginning, you have just the number of um, targets that you put into the reaction. And the doubling, the logarithmic doubling starts immediately, but it takes a long time for the fluorescence to build up to the point where the, the camera can actually get a good picture of it. When the, the doubling takes off, then, is this inflection point is very important. The, the, and we'll talk about that quite a bit later. Um, then go into a leveling out at the top phase. And this happens when your reaction is starting to peter out. So when uh, the polymerases have been too hot for too long and they aren't working so well anymore, or when you're running out of DNTPs or something like that. But you can see that when you start at the beginning, um, if you started with one copy, then at about 20 cycles, right here at this takeoff point, you already have a million copies of your target. And then by 10 cycles later, you have a billion copies of your target. The, those data can be shown in a couple of different views. The linear view is how I usually choose to look at things, uh, but the log view is how I choose to set the threshold and we will talk about that later. Um, but in the, the two views match each other in that this inflection point is the important spot. So the, the exponential region of the graphs is what you're going to be focusing on. The log linear is not that important. It's where your reaction is starting to peter out and then the plateau is really nothing to concern yourself with. So if you have a given sample that you want to run on the thermocycler and you do a tenfold serial dilution, your curves are going to look like this, where your original sample comes up first and then a little while later, your diluted sample comes up. And that makes 
a lot of uh, intrinsic sense, that it's going to take longer if you have less product to be able to see that product. Um, what happens, though, is that uh, your, your CTs are, uh, you have a lower CT for a higher sample concentration. And I will talk about CT uh, right now, I guess. Uh, so um, part of the data analysis for real time is to set a threshold. And the thermocyclers will generally set a threshold for you. Um, but there are ways to set the threshold that are more or less appropriate for what you're doing. And you cannot necessarily rely on the computer to set the threshold appropriately. So you need to just not just grab the first threshold that the computer throws at you. You need to do some analysis first. But once the threshold is set, then the CT is considered the point at which your fluorescence curve crosses that threshold. So in this case, for the concentrated sample, you can see the CT is 23.6. And then as the sample is diluted, the CT goes up. So more sample means a lower CT number. There is another function of the data that is not really discussed until the very end, but it is this cycle cutoff, this vertical dotted line. Cycle cutoff is the place at which you determine whether your sample is positive for the target of interest or negative for the target of interest. And there tends to be a lot of confusion between the word threshold and the word cutoff. So those are two very different concepts to keep in mind. When you are evaluating whether or not a real time has performed appropriately, there are three different things that you need to check, sensitivity, precision, and efficiency. And I'm gonna go through each of those. So sensitivity is what is the fewest number of targets that your primer probe combination is capable of detecting. In this example, um, down here at one target copy per reaction, um, you can see that there is a spread here between when the, the two brown curves come up. That's because it's hard to pipette exactly one copy into any given tube. Precision then is how similar your replicates can be. So I would strongly encourage you to run all of your controls and your unknowns in triplicate. Um, duplicate if you have to, but at least, you know, triplicate to get started when you're first setting up your real-time PCRs. Because what you're looking for is the distance between the CT of your replicates, and you want that distance to be less than or equal 0.3 CT. And then the distance between your tenfold dilutions. So if this is one copy, 10 copy, 100 copies, you want this distance to be consistently 3.3 CT. So 3.3 CT means one log of concentration difference in your original sample. Efficiency is how well your reaction adhered to the idea that it should be a logarithmic doubling. Um, as I mentioned you over time will get uh, the, the DNTPs to run out, the polymerase gets tired, whatever, um, but also PCR inhibitors that you have put into your reaction that you carried along with the template can make your reaction not function at its peak. And so the amplification efficiency is 
routinely calculated by the thermocycler software. And what happens is it takes the data from these curves, from your dilution series, and graphs it with an x-axis of the log starting quantity. So you have to tell your software that you know this sample right here correlated to, in this case, 10 to the three copies of initial target. And then this one was 10 to the four, 10 to the five, and so on. And then it, the y-axis is CT. So the CT is on the x-axis for the original raw data that's coming in. CT is on the y-axis when we're looking at the standard curve. And it's mapping that CT uh, or that cycle where your fluorescence crosses the threshold against how many copies you told the machine was in there. And you will get a curve that hopefully is a straight line. So your R squared measurement of how straight the line is needs to be equal to or greater than 0 0.98. If you're under 0 0.98, then that means that's a bad run and you need to repeat it. Also, the slope of this line is intrinsically related to the efficiency of the amplification. So the slope of that line is used to determine, to calculate what percent efficient your reaction was. Um, down here, I mentioned that a slope of minus 3.3 means that your reaction was 100% efficient. So to calculate efficiency from slope, this is the equation and you have a curve and the, uh, the software will tell you the R squared and will also tell you Y equals MX plus B. And that slope is what is carried into the calculation for determining efficiency. In this case, a slope of minus 3.4 gives a 99.5% PCR efficiency. So efficiency um, affects CT. I just got done saying that CT affects efficiency. Um, but efficiency of your reaction affects the CT calculations that you're going to get for your unknowns. So the CTs that you get for your knowns determine, you know, help you figure out what the efficiency is, and then that helps you figure out what the CT and copy number is for your unknowns. So in this example, um, we'll have a curve that is 100% PCR efficient, and say you have um, X is a very few number of uh, targets in your reaction. And so that's gonna give you a high CT. When you have a lot of copies, it, that's going to give you a low CT. And at 100% PCR efficiency, the slope is minus 3.3. Now, if you run an unknown and your CT is going to be affected because the amplification efficiency was affected by um, probably PCR inhibitors that were in your template. So your slopes will look different. And this is why it's important to use the right kind of control samples for running your, uh, your known standard curve because whatever is contaminating your unknowns can make your calculations um, for your knowns not match up to the calculations for your unknowns. But in this case, um, you can see that at a low copy number for your unknown, you're gonna get a CT that's higher than it actually should be. And 
for a high number, you're going to get a CT that's lower than it actually should be. And so that's going to affect the, uh, how you analyze your data or, or what you think your results are at the end of your experiment. So for evaluating performance to, to evaluate the sensitivity, you need to perform a dilution series and you need to do that preferably in an environment that is going to be replicative of the unknowns that you're running. Also, when you have very low copy number um, for your knowns or your unknowns, the more reps you can do, the more likely you're going to get a good statistical look at what is actually happening in those samples. For instance, I have recently been running an experiment and I have run it over 100 times and 9% of the time I am getting a positive. That suggests to me, because I've then sequenced those and, and know that yes, it is what I think it is, that there is a really, really low number of, uh, of pathogens in my sample. And so a very low percentage of the time am I getting a signal. So you want to also look at the precision. So for that, you're gonna need a minimum of three replicates. Again, you want your reps to be within 0.3 CT. And all of this you're going to do before you start um, running experiments with your unknowns. You wanna do all of this just with looking at standard curves initially. And then you uh, finally, efficiency, you need to do five, uh, tenfold serial dilutions with five data points, a minimum of five data points, and you're looking for your slope to be as close to minus 3.3 as possible, and your R squareds need to be greater than 0.98. So how do you set up an, a reaction to begin with? Um, you're going to have your unknowns, your, you know, the, the samples that you're actually interested in, but you also need to have no template controls, at least in triplicate, um, particularly around the edges of the plates. That's where you're most likely to get any cross contamination. And so I like to have my no template controls on the edges. You also are going to need to include a standard curve. Not always, we'll discuss that later, but in most cases, you really should run a standard curve. And it doesn't have to have this many data points. Um, I rel um, routinely just have five data points in my curve and I go down to one copy per reaction. Actually, it's five microliters of that. So five copies per reaction. And everything is done at least in triplicate. Um, at least when you're starting out. Once you start pushing through lots and lots of unknown samples, then you can uh, drop down to duplicates for those unknowns. Um, if you are getting results that you think are strange, <clears throat> um, one way to look for PCR inhibitors is to take a um, an unknown that gives you a result suggesting you have lots of target in it and do tenfold serial dilutions and look at the R squared. If the R squared is not close to one, then you have PCR inhibitors and you need to incorporate that while you're thinking about quantifying your unknowns. All right, so pre-data analysis, you have run your reaction you're standing at the computer and it spits this at you. So what you're looking at, um, this is a screenshot from a BioRad CFX96. Um, that's the thermocycler that I use because I find it intuitive. All of the other thermocyclers will give you a very similar set of screens. So what you have is an amplification plot of the raw data for every 
well in your reaction. So all 96 wells will be there. This square over here, there is no data yet because you have not yet told the computer what your unknowns correlate to. Um, so you, you have not told it that you have standards and a dilution series on your plate. So this region is set up for a, a standard curve analysis. And so the computer is waiting for it, for you to tell it uh, which end is up. Down here is a map of the 96 well plate. And over in the bottom right is a tabular analysis of the CTs for, you know, I said that the computer will just throw a threshold up there for you. And so the CTs that are reflected here are where these curves cross, regardless of whether or not that makes any sense. So these numbers are not something to be concerned about at this point. The first thing you need to do is go in to the plate editor. Let me see here. So you go to plate setup, if you're in a bio rad, the plate editor, and you can tell the computer what each of these is. So over here, right now, they're all unknowns. There is a drop down, And so here I've told the computer that these wells are where my standards are and that these are where my no template controls are in this experiment. Also down here at the bottom, um, actually let's come up here. Um, technical replicates kind of in the middle on the right. So if you highlight all of these and you go over to technical replicates, it'll ask you how many replicates do you have and at what number do you want to start labeling them? And so I would say I have three reps, they're in the horizontal uh, orientation in this run because you know they you could have put them in the plate horizontally or vertically. Um, and that I wanted to start at uh, technical replicate number one. And so you can see that over here on the left, it gave me te technical replicates one, two, three, four, because that's what I asked it to. And then I wanted it to put in the standard curve without me having to type all of this stuff in. So I can go down to, um, no, it's not obvious right there. It's a little hidden here. Um, to, there's a, a standard curve pop up and you tell it how many uh, copies you put into your, you know, your first standards. And then I say, I did a tenfold serial dilution um, from replicates one through six. Hit apply and it puts in 10 to the five, 10 to the four, three, two, one automatically for me. Oh, um, so then if you, you accept all of those changes, go back to the analysis screen. And these are the data that you're starting to see. Um, if you like to have the different colors for different sample types or whatever, um, going back to here, there's this button up here, trace style. You can click that and then assign different colors to different samples. In the standard curve screen, we have the CTs against the log quantities that we told the computer. So five times 10 to the five, five times uh, 10 to the four. And those are shown as circles on the graph. And then my unknowns are shown as Xs. So the circles were placed according to what the log starting quantity was and what the correlating CT was. Um, and then the, long, the line was drawn through those. The X's then fall onto the line that is generated 
And from that, you figure out log starting quantity. Before you can do that, though, you need to make sure that the baseline has been set correctly. Uh, in the log view, it's a lot easier to see the mess that is uh, the background fluorescence. You're not going to see it in the linear view. Um, and the computers generally just automatically take the first, you know, all of this fluorescence in the first 12 cycles and subtracts that out from the readings in all of the rest of your samples, all the different cycles. Um, if you have a sample that is really, really concentrated, you can get curves that are up here and the computer doesn't know that, it will continue to take all of the signal that it finds in the first 12, regardless of you having an active curve there. And then you will find that you get curves that are strange shapes. Um, if that happens, then you go into the software and you tell the software that you only want it to use cycles, you know, one through nine for setting the baseline. Before baseline is subtracted, uh, the data look like this. So each well is going to have an initial fluorescence of its own. And so at the starting point, you're going to get a spread of fluorescence uh, readings. And because of that spread, then where the inflection points gather, everything is offset incorrectly. And so those, those geometric data um, are useless. After the baseline is subtracted, then all of the initial fluorescences are the same and all of the replicates fall on top of one another the way you want them to. So how do you set the threshold? You want to set it in late exponential space. So I showed you uh, the linear and the log phase. Um, and uh, for a, a log curve, it, whoops, it looks like a, um, a waterfall and the exponential phase is right in the middle of the waterfall. Um, it's not this S curve. Um, threshold, I have been using the phrase or the nomenclature CT to describe where the fluorescence curve crosses the threshold. But there are a number of different nomenclatures for this, crossing point, takeoff point, and quantification cycle, CQ. The thermocycler that I use um, uses the CQ nomenclature, so you will see that in these slides. CT and CQ are exactly the same thing. Um, so when your thermocycler initially sets this threshold for you, it takes the initial noise and finds the standard deviation, multiplies by 10, and that's where it sticks the threshold. And so where the threshold is landing really doesn't have anything to do with how good your reaction is. It's kind of a, a random put it up there kind of threshold. Um, and so you definitely want to check. And here is a lovely video. Um, this is made by uh, ABI. Welcome to Ask TACMAN. Today's real-time PCR question What's a threshold and where do I place it? Excellent question. The threshold is a horizontal line in our amplification plot that can be moved up or down on the y-axis. Its purpose, as we'll see in a minute, it tells the software where to take data. Now, not all places on the y-axis are equal. Some regions we want to avoid. Specifically, we don't want to be too low. Otherwise, we get down into the noise. 
Conversely, if we go too high, we're in the linear or plateau phase of amplification where data are less predictable. A happy spot? Some place where all of our curves are straight and parallel to one another. What we really want is to put the threshold wherever the precision of our replicates is highest. That's generally somewhere toward the middle of the geometric phase, or maybe slightly higher. In any case, with a really robust assay, hitting a good spot is quite easy. The default on all Applied Biosystems real-time PCR software is Auto Threshold, meaning the software sets thresholds for us the second we click Analyze. Notice that it sets a different threshold for each assay separately, which is good since not all assays have the same sweet spot. If I want, though, I can switch any one or all of my thresholds to manual mode, then move the line up or down with my mouse. Once the threshold is set and we click Analyze, all the samples get their respective CT values. The attentive viewer might be tempted to ask, well, if the threshold can be moved up or down, doesn't that change CTs? Why, yes, it does. But here's the thing. As long as we keep the threshold firmly within the geometric phase, the relative or delta CT between any two samples stays constant. This fact allows us to do things like calculate full changes in gene expression from sample to sample and to get quantity information from a standard curve. And that's all there is to thresholds. If you have any real-time PCR questions, just ask TACMAN, literally. Okay. Um, I really like showing that you video your because it's, it, it feels to me like I can say it until I'm blue in the face and nobody will believe me. But if it's coming from Doug and ABI, then, you know, it's not just my lone voice in the wilderness. So um, here is an example of setting the threshold. Um, I have changed my curves into the log scale because I like to use this view when I'm setting the threshold. And the threshold creates this curve and these data pop up. So I can see that I have good R squared. I can see that my PCR efficiency is only, you know, 97.7%. You know, it's not bad, but it's not great. Um, my slope is a little bit off. So in this case, um, you know, my, my threshold is, is not quite where I want it to be. And with the data like, or with the threshold here, then I can see this lowest dilution, uh, 10 to the eighth copies per reaction down to 10 to the fourth copies per reaction. And yes, this is a terrible, terrible um, primer probe set. I wouldn't recommend it for anyone. Okay, if I move the threshold up, then again, you can see the PCR efficiency is above 100%. The R squared is still good. The slope uh, looks a little weird though. Um, and you can see that the, what's called the dynamic range. So in between the uh, control data points is really the only area that you can reliably calculate a CT for your unknown. So in the previous slide, we got this region here between 10 to the fifth and 10 to the fourth, moving the threshold up, dropped that 10 to the fourth out. And so now I'm missing all of those uh, potential unknowns that fell there. One thing that I wanted to note to you is that a, an amplification efficiency over 100% actually is not possible. Um, what happens is that if you have PCR inhibitors that slow the amplification down, then that increases the CT, which changes your slope. And as that, that curve gets flatter, then you cross a point at which you it looks like you have more than 100% efficiency, but it's just a function of your reaction having slowed down. 
Okay, so I move the threshold back down a little bit. And here is the sweet spot that Doug was talking about. I have my full 10 to the eighth, 10 to the fourth region for calling unknowns. My R squared is beautiful. My slope is beautiful. My PCR efficiency is beautiful. Um, this is as good as it's going to get. There is another method that we will discuss later on in more detail uh, called the replicate method. And Doug in the ABI video mentioned this in passing that you want to set your threshold where all of your curves are parallel and close to one another. So what he means is you have replicates, you have triplicates hopefully of your known dilutions and you want to move these thresholds so that these CTs are as close to one another as possible. There is another method and I see this method uh, on some diagnostic test kits and it really bothers me. It's called the 5% max RFU method and what is going on is the software, instead of measuring the noise down here or looking at how reproducible uh, your replicates is, it is looking at the data here in the last cycle. And it, it takes some subset of your reactions and your controls and averages them multiplies that number by 0.05 and then sets the threshold at that corresponding uh, relative fluorescence unit. And as I mentioned before, these, where these reactions peter out is not actually a function of a good part of the reaction. So here you can see an enormous difference between uh, you know, it's, it's a thousand RFU difference between the top and the bottom. Um, and so that's basically just throwing a dart at a dartboard to determine how to set the threshold. And I am not a fan of this method. Okay, so CT, as Doug said, you can raise and lower the threshold and that changes CT. CT in the absence of any context by itself is completely meaningless. So these are three runs. I did one on one day and one on the next day and someone else in my lab ran one, uh, I think on the second day also. And these are the results that we got from those three different runs. So here is our uh, 10 to the 6th standard, and we have a range of CTs. We have uh, 18, 16, and 14 being where the curve crosses the threshold. And remember, I said that a difference in CT of 3.3 is one log. So if we were just going to rely on CT to give us information, we are using a fudge factor of a log, which might not be a big deal down here where you know, you're comparing 10 copies to 100 copies, but it could be a very big deal up here where you're comparing 10 to the sixth to 10 to the seventh copies. It could also be a big deal way down at the limit of detection. Is it on the positive side of the cutoff threshold, or is it on the negative side of the cutoff? And the cutoff being that uh, vertical dotted orange line that I showed you a number of slides ago, where on one side, a sample is considered to be negative, and on the other side, a sample is con considered to be positive. So when you are setting your curve, you're going to be looking at the slopes. And the question that I get a lot is, you know, what is an appropriate slope? What is an appropriate amplification efficiency? 
So at what point do I need to run this, uh, this experiment again, basically? And ABI's guidelines are a PCR efficiency of 90% to 110%. Um, I personally prefer the 95% to 105% region. Um, and that of course is until I get a 94% uh, PCR efficiency. And then I think, well, maybe 90 is not so bad. Um, <laughs> but I also never just run an experiment a single time. Um, so uh, the next step is to check your reproducibility, check that you are within 0.3 CTs. Um, is this okay? I don't know. For this one, um, are these okay and these are an outlier that you are going to throw it away? I couldn't tell you just from a quick glance at this photo. You also need to check the reproducibility in that your tenfold serial dilutions give you that 3.3 CT difference. Okay, so that's what you do before you do the data analysis. That is the analysis before the analysis. So then there are four different primary kinds of data analysis that are available to us. Absolute quantification is what I have been referring to up until now. You develop a standard curve and then you use the slope of that curve uh, to, or you use where your fluorescence crosses your threshold to determine CTs for each of your unknowns and then your, uh, your unknowns are going to fall in between your known samples. The standard curve is generated from your standards and your unknowns then land on that line and a vertical line is drawn down to the x-axis and that tells you what your starting quantity was. So here your CT is uh, 26.5 and you are getting uh, five times 10 to the seven copies of your initial target um, when you first started the reaction. So this is basically just Y equals MX plus B. So method number two is a variation on the first method. And it is a way to ask, for instance, how many X's do I have for Y? So if I have tissue culture, I want to know how many viruses there are per cell in my flask. So my, my viral PCR is kind of my main target, where my cell is considered my reference you know, how, how many viruses to sell. Um, in this case, I have the two different reactions shown. Uh, these were a primer probe set for a virus and a primer probe set for a eukaryotic housekeeping gene. And the virus was labeled with the FAM fluorophore, which is shown in blue here. And the uh, eukaryote gene the housekeeping was labeled with hexfluorophore, shown in green. And you can run these independently, so one run after another, or if you have two different colored fluorophores on your two different probes, you can multiplex. So you can run one reaction uh, one run with the two different reactions in every well. And what you can see here is that the, the threshold for the viral reactions is different than the threshold for the housekeeping gene reactions. If they're set appropriately, then you get PCR efficiency of 100% for each of them with nice straight lines, R squared of 0.999 to one. See, this is really nice right here. Relative quantification then is if you have sample one and you measure how many copies 
of your housekeeping gene are in that sample and you measure how many copies of your virus are also in that sample, then you normalize your unknowns. So if I had treated, uh, if I had an experiment where I was treating flasks with different antivirals and I had a, an untreated control, then that untreated control is my reference. Um, and so what you initially do is um, you're, you're going to normalize your target, your virus, to your reference, which is your uh, housekeeping gene. So uh, the copy number for your viral divided by the copy number of your target gives you the normalized um, the, the normalized number of cells of, of viruses. And in this particular example, the control had about 761 viruses for every cell that was in my sample. Then I need to figure out the amount relative to the control for these antivirals. So I take the normalized C, uh, copy number for my control and use that uh, as the denominator for my other unknowns and get a relative number. So a control is as it is to itself, one. Uh, antiviral one, in this example, caused an upregulation or an increase in virus production in this uh, sample. So that's not a good one. But antiviral three is only 0.4. So that is a good uh, chemical or treatment for this particular virus. The third method for analyzing real-time data uh, adds a layer of complexity in that you are looking for how a gene responds under different conditions. So you are comparing, uh, for instance, how much interleukin-6 is made in a healthy rabbit as compared to a sick rabbit. And uh, you're, you're comparing it to itself just under different treatments. Um, in this case, you have different curves, different looking curves for the different treatments. And uh, as with the, uh, the relative, you can do single or duplex reactions. These uh, calculations are also going to give you fold change, just like the other one did. did. Um, in this case, the housekeeping gene is the calibrator and the, uh, the unknown and the calibrator, they have to have the same amplification efficiencies. So your primer probe combinations have to work the same for both of the things that you're measuring if you're going to do delta delta CT. And so you have to do a lot of upfront work to determine whether or not those two primer probe sets are going to be compatible. There are different ways of choosing calibrators. They are generally housekeeping genes and they not only need to be validated against the, uh, the target gene that you're interested in, they need to be calibrated in that you know from previous experiments, previous published literature, that under the two conditions that you are testing, that that housekeeping gene does not change. So, it actually is going to be a stable baseline for the gene that you're testing. Then there is a normalizer, which is going to be the untreated control. It's not necessarily your unknown. It is the untreated control 
subsection of your unknowns. Um, a normalizer could also be, for instance, the lowest copy number sample. Um, if you were testing samples from like the brain, the liver, the heart, and you wanted to know how much uh, a gene expressed in the heart compared to the brain, um, then in that case, uh, your, your, the brain would be the normalizer. Once you've done all this upfront work, then you don't need to run standard curves anymore. But your PCR efficiencies have to be the same. And when I say they have to be the same, what does that mean and how do you tell? Um, basically, they need to be less than 10, the PCR efficiencies need to be less than 10% different from one another. And you're looking for your assays to have parallel, uh, parallel slopes. And so here's a zoom in on the, uh, the thresholds for the hex and the thresholds for the fam. And it looks like, you know, everybody is kind of at the same angle here. So, you know, this is probably okay, just eyeballing it. But you saw some of my previous curves. What does this mean? I mean, can you actually use these two primer probe sets in a delta delta CT calculation? And what you have to remember is that FAM gets its own threshold and HEX gets its own threshold. And so if you zero in on those, then Yes, it looks a lot like that previous slide. It looks like when they're, the samples are crossing the threshold, you actually are in parallel. So is that okay? I mean, it seems like kind of a stick in your thumb and pull out of a pull out a plum situation. Um, but no, there's there's mathematical calculation. Um, so you want the absolute value of the slope of the log input <laughs> compared to the delta CT needs to be less than 0.1. So what that means is uh, you do your, your initial delta CT calculation, which is subtracting your housekeeping uh, copy a uh, CT from your unknown CT to get your delta CT. That's what delta CT is. And then you graph delta CT against those dilutions. So the input copies, 10 to the eighth, 10 to the seventh, 10 to the sixth, correlates to uh, 0 0.89, 0 0.80, 0 0.75. And then you get the uh, the equation for that line. And what you're looking for is that slope to be less than 0.1. And in this case, it is. And so, yes, we can use these two primer probe combinations, even though the slopes look so weirdly different. Okay, so you've done all of that work and you run an experiment and suddenly you realize here you are about to analyze your data and you don't know where you're gonna set the threshold because you didn't run a standard curve. So now what? Back to the replicate method that uh, Doug from ABI showed us where you're going to set the threshold as low as possible in the exponential phase where your replicates are as close together as possible. Um, preferably where the CTs of your replicates are within 0.3 of one another. And that's how you're going to set that threshold. So how do you calculate delta delta CT from these data? Uh, we already discussed calculating delta CT. That's just the difference between your gene of interest and your housekeeping gene. Um, and then you are going to calculate delta delta CT as the first calculated delta CT minus 
the delta CT of your untreated control. So your delta delta CT for your untreated control is always going to be zero. Then to get the relative relate to get the relationship between your treated unknowns to your control, then you take two to the power of the negative delta delta CT. And two to the zero is one. So your control is equivalent to itself. In this case, antiviral one, again, gives us a number higher than one. So there's more virus in that uh, sample than the untreated and antiviral three uh, suppressed the virus growth in that sample. If we compare then the, uh, this, the relative method to delta delta CT method, we can do that in this case because of the way I set up these hypothetical experiments. You can see that the numbers are very similar. So even though there's a little bit of guesswork with setting the threshold for delta delta CT, you've done enough initial work to be confident in that. Okay, the fourth method, I see that we're going over an hour. I'm just gonna keep going so you can stay or leave, it's up to you. Um, the fourth method is linear regression. And linear regression, instead of using a standard curve, uses the, uh, the relative fluorescence of any given sample compared to itself to generate its own curve. So instead of measuring an unknown against a known, you're measuring, you're making sure that the unknown's data is appropriate. Um, so that it can tell you itself whether or not uh, whether or not the, the reaction failed or is giving you good data. So um, there's this paper from 2003, Ramakers, where they present this program called LinReg that is an easily downloadable tool. And that image that I just showed you came from that. Um, and here's an example of a sample B6 um, where you, you see the, uh, the log curve and it's going to calculate the PCR efficiency as 10 to the slope. But where does it take the slope? So it finds the linear region of this curve and calculates the slope from that. So this region bounded by the blue can move up and down. And you know, in some cases will only contain three data points. In some cases will contain six data points. Um, but the, the software is looking for where your data are basically uh, of the same slope and, and parallel. Um, and so N0 is the number of samples or a number of target genes you had in your initial sample. And that is the same thing as uh, the threshold number here divided by um, the PCR efficiency to the CT which is also the same thing as 10 to the y-intercept. So 10 to wherever this line crosses the y-intercept down here. Happily, the software calculates these data for you. Um, so it will calculate what the threshold is and it will calculate the PCR efficiency for each reaction uh, for each well of your 96 well plate individually. And you can throw out reactions that failed um, and only keep the good ones. And it will calculate the CT for you. Um, 
And then it will also tell you how many copies of target you had in your initial sample. Um, so that is a method that I don't use very often. Um, it makes a lot of intuitive sense to me that particularly when you're dealing with unknowns that have a lot of PCR inhibitors, it's going to be difficult to find a matrix in which to dilute your plasmid, for instance, um, for your standard curve. It, it's going to be hard to find the correct matrix that's going to have all of those PCR inhibitors that will be correct for you know all of the unknowns on your 96 well plate. Um, and so this method uh, allows you to disassociate those things and look at each reaction on its own merits. Okay, so what do you need to do for publishing? Uh, Buston is a very opinionated guy and has a lot of papers about this. Um, I recommend you look at this 2009 paper uh, where he publishes the MyKey guidelines, which would be the minimum information for publication of a real-time experiment. And um, he is trying to get people to publish in a way that anyone around the world who picks up that manuscript can then reliably repeat what they did. Um, you know, and that makes sense. But figuring out what that subset of information is was kind of non-trivial, and so he's done it for us. Yay. So there is a long list of things to pay attention to in the paper, but uh, the top 10, um, in my opinion, are, uh, first of all, that real-time PCR is not reverse transcription PCR. So um, we need to get the RT-PCR nomenclature used for real time out of the literature. Um, you need to detail your experimental design. You need to detail your sampling. So, you know, how old was the animal and um, did you, was it a nasal swab or a throat swab? You know, that, that kind of thing. Um, what was the GPS position of the soil sample that you took and at what depth? Things like that. Um, you need to tell the nucleic acid extraction method that you used, and that's a big deal. Uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow in troubleshooting. Um, but how you extract your DNA is going to affect your results a lot. Um, if you used reverse transcription, if you were at trying to quantify a, um, an RNA, you need to include the actual RT methods involved. You need to talk about the targets, including any GenBank accession numbers that are available, um, why you chose you know, X subset of genes, um, you were looking for PCV2A and not PCV2 in general, for instance. Um, the sequence of your primers and probes, you need to publish those in the appropriate five prime to three prime direction. So you will flip your reverse sequence, your reverse primer sequence when you publish it. Um, there are a lot of papers out there where the reverse primer is included erroneously. And so that is definitely something you need to check. Your qPCR protocol. So all of the temperatures and times that you use in the actual thermocycling, you know, how many cycles you used, all of that stuff. The qPCR validation. So all of those things that I talked about, the things that you do before you start running your unknowns. Um, if you were doing delta delta CT, were your PCR efficiencies equivalent? And um, are we just going to take your word for it? Um, 
all of those things that I talked about. And finally, how you did your data analysis. Was it a relative? Was it delta delta CT? Exactly what did you do? Did you use linear regression? Um, all of those things are important. Um, okay, so some real basics for when you are developing a real-time PCR. Um, I worked at the university, at universities, for many years, and I know for a fact that pipettes get dropped on the floor, and I also know for a fact that I didn't even know pipettes could be calibrated until I joined the government. Um, so we use pipettes that are calibrated twice a year, and um, I am very happy that we do that. Um, a lot of universities will have calibration labs that you can take your pipettes to. Um, I definitely recommend you do that. When you are doing your dilution series, for instance, you always want to pipette larger volumes. Um, it's much less of a difference to pipette 99 microliters compared to 100 microliters than it is um, 0.9 microliters compared to one microliter. Um, it's just going to be easier to get good precision. That said, I understand that a lot of samples are precious and that in a university setting, particularly these real-time master mixes are crazy expensive. So I run all of my reactions in 20 microliters, 20 microliter final reaction volumes. Um, and when I'm doing my dilution series of my controls, I use 45 microliters of diluent and five microliters of uh, the, the DNA sample that I'm diluting. You need to use an appropriate material for your diluent for your standard. So if you have, you know, if you're, you're looking at salmonella in cows, know that you have a cow that doesn't have any salmonella, extract a lot of DNA from that cow, um, and then use that, that DNA as the diluent for your plasmid for your dilution series. Um, if you do that, then your uh, any, any PCR inhibitors will appear in your standard curve and you'll know immediately that you have a problem. Um, when you uh, are first making your standard controls, your standard curves, you need to do serial dilutions. Tenfold serial dilutions is the best way to go, and you need to use a minimum of five dilution points of those tenfold dilutions. You need to mix those standards thoroughly after each dilution. So uh, someone was telling me that he was using the same pipette tip. He, you know, removed 10 microliters of DNA from his stock tube, put it into 90 microliters of water, vortexed, used that same pipette tip to then transfer from that first dilution, 10 microliters into his second dilution. You're really not gonna wanna do that. You can use the same pipette tip when you're going from low concentration to high concentration, but you don't wanna do it high concentration to low concentration. Also, when I say mix standards thoroughly, I probably go overboard, but between each tenfold dilution, I will vortex a tube for a full 60 seconds. I use a timer. Um, after every run, you need to check the R squared. You need to look for uh, outliers in your standard control and, and throw those out. If you have more than two outliers or if your spacing between your controls is different than uh, 3.3 CT, you need to repeat that experiment. 
Um, I really recommend that you run unknowns in triplicate until you become very, very sure of your skills and your experiment and your, uh, your primer probe set. And at that point, then you could drop down to duplicates with your unknowns. And also have someone else in your lab run, you know, at least a standard curve using uh, your, your positive control and your primers and probes and make sure that you're not the only person in the world who can get the, the answer that you're getting. Okay, so that's all I have for you today. Um, a really, really big thank you to Krista Reed and Hannah Hill. Crystal has been holding my hand through these last hours um, and helped me embed the videos so you didn't have to watch me do insanity today. So I expect you all to thank Crystal. Uh, <laughs> and Hannah set up the Zoom and of course, thanks to uh, everyone else who allowed me to do this and my contact information. As I always say, please do not be shy. There's a reason I put my contact information at the end of these seminars. So are there any questions? I have, I a, have question. a question. Hi, yes. Um, um, so, so I can hear myself can hear talking, myself. but anyway. Um, oh. the... Hang on, let me, let me mute me. Okay, the question was about the uh, double derivative method that Roche uses to determine their threshold versus kind of what ABI and BioRed use, which is more of a, I guess, human-based method because they just figure out where the noise is and then go a standard deviation or two above that. Um, have you had, do you have any feeling for um, the reproducibility of the, threshold method for ABI because I've mostly used uh, Roche in the past and Roche is all uh, mathematics. There's no um, human intervention, I guess, in figuring out where the threshold is. Well, if you look at where Roche has been putting your threshold in the context of all those things that I talked about today, and you're happy with where Roche is putting your threshold, like it, it makes sense, then that's great. Um, some, some softwares are better at setting the thresholds than others. And you know, if, if Roche is doing a good job, well then kudos to them. Um, but I do recommend that you check that it makes sense. Anyone else? Yes, I have a question. Yes. So you talked about uh, the Delta Delta DT, and in that you said that if you want to use the uh, the fluorescent probe method, um, the hydrolysis probe method, that you must have. Um, the, the probe must bind similarly to both the calibrator and the reference genome. So if I want to quantify a uh, gene expression for my gene of interest, and I have to find a reference, a reference gene, for example, actin. So does that mean that the probe has to be similar for both of those genes? Or, and another question is, can I run both uh, in the same 96 well plate? Yes, you can run them both in the same wells, in the same plate. Um, if your two probes are labeled with different fluorophores, so you probably want to go with a FAM on one and a HEX on the other. Um, and yeah, you, you need to make sure that your amplification efficiencies for both primer probe sets are equivalent. And I'm happy to, to talk with you about what you're getting, what you're seeing, if that's helpful. Okay, that's helpful, thanks. Anybody else? 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. And uh, it is troubleshooting tomorrow. So I'll see you then. Thanks. Bye.